Welcome to another episode of Profession Session. I'm your host, Brody Vinson. Today, I've got Mark Musselman on, and he is a coach, a business owner, a consultant, and he's had quite the experience over the lifetime of his career running a number of different businesses throughout it. He's going to share a lot of that experience with us today, as well as the lessons he's learned and the things that he now coaches and consults on according to the lessons he's learned. <laughs> I'd love to start with your first business because like we were talking about off air a little bit, you've been through about four businesses now and it started in a really unconventional way, something you were kind of thrown into. Could you tell us a little bit about just how this whole journey started for you? Yeah, thanks. You know, uh, so I'm going to actually um, go back to the very beginning. I, like many people, you may be included, really started my first business when I was in my young teens as a lawn mowing business, you know, and I love the independence. I love the opportunity to go out and create clients and then figure a way how to not just mow a lawn, but then, you know, take it to the next level of service and the next level of service. And pretty soon this friend of mine, Mark Rukavina and I, we owned the neighborhood in which we you know, were living with, you know, a lawn service that had all kinds of other things that went with it in the wintertime. Like you do, you shovel snow and you weed and all that stuff. So I, that entrepreneurial spirit has always been there. Um, and then I, Kind of worked my entire way through college as well had multiple jobs through college but the first career piece is the one we were talking about before we jumped on which is the sense that i was part of a family-owned business i didn't start there i started working for ernest and Julio gallo straight out of college got some phenomenal training and then jumped into what was a very small business that was started by my father and his brother in 1965 and there were about eight employees i came in with a set of skills um and then there was a point in which we grew the business to about 30, roughly about 30 million, 300 employees. And my dad decided to retire. I'm one of five kids. All five of us were in the business. I'm four out of five. And I got tapped on the shoulder to step into this role of being the CEO of a very established, you know, 40 year old family owned business, about 5,000 customers around the United States and some in the Caribbean and Alaska, et cetera. Um, and I had no idea what I was doing, like absolutely none. <laughs> I just, you know, I'd known enough about sales and marketing to get myself in trouble and to help put some systems in place to grow the business. But that transition was massive. You know, um, I had one area of responsibility, which was sales and marketing. And then all of a sudden I had organizational responsibility. Um, so the first thing I knew just as a place of checking is I knew I didn't know everything I needed to know. And then the question was, how do I close the gap from what I understood that I knew to what I understood I didn't know. So I hired a coach in 1999 um, before coaching was even a thing, you know, and I grew up, um, you know, you might as well being involved in athletics. And I was also in music and musical theater. And so I always had an appreciation and an aptitude towards being coachable because, you know, that's the way you grow as a young athlete or a young performer. So I just knew that there would be something there for me that if I was willing to take that on. So I hired this guy, his name is Stephen McGee, still does his work out in California. He's remarkable. Um, and he helped me. And the very first thing he did is gave me a book called Your Best Year Yet as a place. And, and that book helped me kind of go through some questions that were really thoughtful questions like, you know, what, what did I want? Like, you know, what was I shooting for, et cetera. And then from there, um, he helped me put in place some, I just say, I always look at it as the leadership toolbox. And he helped me, you know, put one tool after another into that box. Um, so I went from a person who didn't know a single thing about running an organization to growing and learning how to run one and uh, did that for another decade and, and then transitioned on, you know, in 2008, nine through bankruptcy, I will say, I mean, we got caught in that massive credit crunch that came through in 2008, 2009. You know, again, that's that 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 was something I used to shy away from and hide because I had sort of shame and embarrassment. But I don't do that anymore because as long as you're failing forward, even as one as visible and painful as that was, there's so many opportunities to grow from that experience. So that was the sort of the formative years, right? Uh, coming in and having that responsibility and and uh, 
I was 30 years old when I got tapped on the shoulder and I had really no idea what I was doing and just had to learn it by partnering with somebody who knew a lot more about that than I did. Coming out of that experience, going bankrupt after all those years, how do you make that decision to consciously fail forward? And how do you overcome that, that hardship and that difficulty? How do you land back on your feet? Well, they're called four kids. That helps, right? <laughs> so, I mean, um, I had a responsibility along with my wife at the time. You know, these four kids needed to eat. They needed to have clothes. We had, I had two homes at the time. Um, mortgages, no income, uh, lost virtually everything. And, you know, every day you wake up, the choice is like, listen, I, I could, I could sit here and feel sorry for myself, which I did. You know, I, I, I don't want to pretend like, you know, I threw the cape on and the next day I'm flying out the window. And, you know, I, there were days that it really was hard. Uh, it was hard to get myself in that mindset and that headspace to move my life immediately forward. Um, but, you know, you don't have much time to rest. And I've always been somebody who sees the glass, if not half full, half overflowing. So, um, you know, it's one of those things like, here's what happened. And then now I have a choice. What do I make of what happened? And, you know, this kind of taps into some of my philosophical leanings, which would be stoic, right? You know, a sense that uh, stoicism is, you know, there's what happens and there's what you do with what happens. Um, and it's really the reaction to the circumstance that dictates the outcome. So, you know, I found myself in an unwanted uh, position and, un, you know, uh, undesired position. And then I was like, okay, I need to move forward. So, you know, so that's, that's just, it's just like mostly the responsibility and the notion that I was young. I was 40 years old when that bankruptcy happened. And it's like, I've got the majority of my life in front of me and, I better get busy creating again and reinventing myself quickly or this thing could go south very, very fast. I want to dig into that for a moment because I haven't covered bankruptcy on the show before. I haven't. And, and I, I wanted to thank you for being so open with that for one, because there's probably people who do feel a sense of shame around it, having gone through it or maybe approaching it who haven't who don't feel open to sharing it. So I, I want to thank you for sharing it. I'd also like to dig into it a little bit more. What is, what is, what are the feelings that are going through your head as that happens? And, and how, how does, how does that come to happen? Is it the type of thing where things are kind of just heading downhill and you, you feel like you've got to stick it out and eventually you figure out that you can't, I, I've never really talked about it before. Yeah, it's a great question. And all of those are appropriate. And I love talking about it openly. And what I know about, you know, the conversation that you and I are in right now, having gone through bankruptcy um, in a very, very, very large way, you know, there's 300 employees, we were a darling um, of a customer to the bank that we were using at the time, which I'll leave nameless, um, because they could have, I think, helped us prevent having gone down the path. They just found themselves in a position where they no longer wanted to work through the circumstance. They wanted to work themselves out of the circumstance, which are, is a massive distinction. So, um, you know, you and I could literally spend the next hour and a half on this one conversation. There's a lot of um, richness in it. I think the thing to say about being in the process is every day that I was, when I first became aware of the, the, the bank who really, you know, this is where ownership is interesting, you know, we were an asset-based lending um, finance business. So we used inventory and receivables to borrow from the bank. And, you know, we had a line of credit that related to those assets up to 11 million that we could borrow. And we were always tapping around six, six and a half million, sometimes five, depending on the cash flow. Um, but we depended on that line of credit to operate our business. And, and what I really understood is that, you know, while we owned it on paper, um, we did not own it, you know, Really. So I think one of the things is to really understand who owns the business that you're operating. If you're, you know, in a business where you've brought in equity partners and they have a majority position and you, know, you can find yourself on the wrong side of that equation pretty quickly as well. Um, so I'd say I showed up virtually every day determined. What I mean by determined is that I was committed to trying to find once we knew we were in a place that was headed that direction to find a solution. There were about 300 people who depended on me finding a solution that 
broadly worked as well as it could in those circumstances in which we did. I mean, a hundred percent of the people who were an employee or a contracted, you know, sales rep were paid full and whole. Um, we lost my family a hundred percent ownership in the business, which was the, you know, the, that was the, the big price to pay for finding ourselves in that circumstance. Um, and there were moments of absolute desperation and pain. And, you know, you talk about um, being brought to your knees. Yeah, I, I was brought to my knees multiple times. And um, one of the most, uh, I'd say, challenging aspects of being in it is when you become adversarial with anybody and your adversary has the leverage, <laughs> um, you're in a vulnerable situation. So in our case, the bank, had, we were in what's called a forbearance agreement month to month. And I was holding company-wide meetings at the beginning of every two week pay period saying, listen, here we are, you know, I, I, I'm inviting you to please come back and, you know, but I don't know if I can pay you because the bank, hasn't told me yet whether they'll continue to lend us money and finance the business as we kind of work through and towards a solution. And that banker um, would wait until 11.59 p.m. on November 30th, December 31st, January 31st, and make me sweat as a CEO until that. And then, and then I'd get a call or I'd get an email. We decided to, for, you know, continue the forbearance and uh, it was just cruel and it was, you know, unnecessary. And um, I, I always say to my kids, I think that whole period took about 10 years off my life because I was bathed like 24 seven in cortisol and all the things that, you know, uh, adrenaline that we know are, uh, they, they, have, they leave a mark when you're in it that much. So high, high stress, um, wouldn't wish it on anybody. At, you know, there's that adage, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What doesn't kill you makes you smarter. Um, and, you know, I'm a firm believer that all of us, you know, will face one, if not multiple things that take us to our knees. And when you're in that place and you're brought to your knees, and it could be a family member that, you know, has befallen some kind of illness or a marriage that ends or, you know, you name it, a child who got unwilling, you know, becomes sick, et cetera. Uh, it's really what you make of yourself in that aftermath. And, uh, you know, so uh, there's a guy named Richard Rohr who wrote a series of great books. He's an incredible human being. Um, and he has written a book called Falling Upward, right? I call it Falling Forward. He calls it Falling Upward. But the idea is that, you know, going through there um, and uh, this conversation we're having, to me, is a, is a real raw conversation because i think the thing that every business owner i don't care whether you're 18 and starting a business whether you're 35 whether you're 75 fears the most is losing what they've created it's the single biggest fear they have there's no bigger fear they have as an entrepreneur than to lose the thing that they started and created in one way or another so um what i've really come to recognize is by having a conversation like the one we're having it opens doors it opens hearts it opens conversation and then you know, once that door and that heart and that conversation start, um, you know, there are things that I have the opportunity to share with somebody that are not commonplace. Um, and, and, and so I, I don't know if that answers your question fully, but that, that, so every day waking up, just, I had to recenter myself. Like I'm certain I can find a solution. I don't know what the solution is and I'm going to commit as much time and energy as I have available in my body to finding that today. And then at the end of the day, I mean, I didn't have a solution for a very long time. And then I did. And then once I had it, which is I found a private equity group who wanted to buy the assets. Well, actually, wanted to buy the note from the bank. And then um, they bought it. And then I, I, they, basically they became the owner at that point in time. And so then it was really how to work with them. Wow. What a story. I, without getting into too much detail, I've had moments, not quite like that, but I've had moments similarly where I just bathed in cortisol every day for weeks or months at a time because of a particular issue going on with the business that I was in at the time. My, a question that came up that I had for you during that time. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs have faced moments like that. Yeah. And when I think back to before going through moments like that to after, 
I think it taught me skills uh, or whether it was just about teaching me skills for managing it or about, I, I think, raising the tolerance that I had for those high stress times. Do you think that moments like that are necessary to grow as an entrepreneur? Oh, well, I'd, I'd say they're almost inevitable. Uh, so I don't know too many entrepreneurs who haven't faced a dark night, right? In whatever form it takes. Um, and I think, you know, confronting the dark night in whatever form it takes is a maturation process. Um, it, it also uh, conditions me and anyone who has that experience to be more equipped to face the next dark night in whatever way it form, you know, shows up. So, you know, life kind of, I think, scales that way, kind of stacks that way. Right. So, um, and, and I think each of those, um, each of those opportunities to be pushed into that place of distress and, um, adversity ideally creates more character, creates, creates more compassion has that capacity, right? So you and I talked before we jumped on here just about this idea of, you know, scaling up and, and stacking skills that start when I'm in my, you know, first iteration of owning and leading. And, you know, I was an owner of that business as well. You know, my family was all owners. Um, and I looked at it that way every single day, right? And there's a distinction between owning and a uh, business and running as an employee in a business. There just is. But, um, you know, one of the things that I think is critical to leadership is that ability to learn from those moments and then create a deeper sense of virtues and values and perspective from the experience so that as I grow as a leader into my 40s, into my 50s, which I am now, you know, um, it, it gives me a much broader range of capabilities to respond to circumstances that I didn't used to have. And so, I mean, like I, I, I told you, I'm, I'm a part owner and, you know, basically the co-founder of an operation, it's a business in Ireland, in Dublin, and we have gone through some very significant moments of adversity. Um, and a couple of the guys who were in it, I mean, they were like so stressed, losing massive amount, And I'm like sleeping like a baby, like this is nothing. I mean, and, and so I think that sense of being so calm at 57, as opposed to being um, really, really wound up and unbelievably anxious when I was 37, 40, you know, much younger, it, that's the difference, right? And life just seasons you. It's, it has an opportunity to season you. And and I say opportunity because some people become bitter about that thing. They become the victim and, you know, they blame everybody and they get stuck in the moment and they can't grow on and don't reinvent themselves and, and the rest of their life, you know, seems to me like it has some real challenges. Um, and uh, it's funny because I, I was just on a call with my ex-wife before I jumped on this with you. And we were talking just broadly speaking about, um, you know, this idea of what, what has life taught us as, you know, and, and I think that's the one thing is that stuff is going to happen. Right. You know, there's that saying shit happens and it does and, and, and it'll come at all of us. And it's when we no longer have control of a circumstance that that invites a whole bunch of different questions and perspectives and opportunities. Prior to that, in my 20s, you know, I, I, I had I thought I had control of everything. Right. I, my ego was, you know, at, at 30 years old running a 30 million dollar business. I mean, I thought I was the king of whatever. Right. And, and so part of that lesson is, you know, when you're younger, don't take yourself so seriously. Right. This too shall pass. And, and, and there's a season for everything. And, uh, you know, so I think humility is, a, is something that's often absent in a younger leader that if it could be brought in, you know, would be a really great virtue to have. Um, and I don't mean false humility. I mean, like genuine like I'm here. This is a blessing. It's it's a gift to be here. And what do I do with this gift to make the biggest impact that I'm designed to make with this business and these people? Right. So those are some of the things I'd say um, as an older person looking backwards and not to go on, but I coach uh, high school rugby and have I've coached youth athletics for the last 25 years. And um, 
I do leadership work with the students who play on the rugby team that I coach. Um, so this stuff applies whether you're 14, which is when they start like as freshmen, really right in that range, all the way till you know you're dead, until you're you know in, in the grave. So you know, there's no there's no there's no there there, and there's no stopping. Coming out of that first business, the bankruptcy and having learned all those lessons, obviously you find yourself in a place where you've got the rest of your life ahead of you and you have to figure out something to do. Could you tell me about that next period of time and how you reinvented yourself and what that led to? Yeah. Well, it goes back to the guy that I hired, uh, Stephen McGee, when I hired him in 1999. I hired him multiple times to do multiple things. He was an incredibly, is an incredibly talented consultant and coach and mentor. And so when the bankruptcy happened, uh, like I said, I lost everything. I mean, literally, like virtually everything. And uh, I had a, I had a 401k and I called Steve and, and I was just talking to him. Oh, it's good timing because I'm doing this thing. I'm, I'm going to bring on an apprentice. I said, well, tell me about it. So it's going to cost you 50 grand to do that. I said, oh, okay. Uh, what's involved? He says, well, you don't get to make any money and you get to come with me on my business and learn what I do for a year. Oh, okay. And it's going to be a lot of work. And then you'll have an opportunity to build your own practice after that. So I went to my wife and said, listen, we lost everything. I got $150,000 401k that I had from my, you know, rolling money from my paychecks into this thing. I want to go cash it. I got to pay the government probably, what is it? 30% tax, you know, penalty on it for early withdrawal. And I'm going to give this guy $50,000 and I'm going to carry his bag and work, earn nothing for a year. What do you think? She said, yeah, if, that, if that's what you think. So that's what I did. Um, so I went and cashed it. I gave him a check. He tore the check up in front of me and said, when you're really committed, come back. I did. Went back home, wrote another check, came back. And, did, and, and I started with him, worked with him for a year. And, uh, you know, and then I, I, I have been doing that ever since. That was in basically... 2009, January 1st of 2009 is really when I say I launched my business, my practice. Wow. There's, um, there's a certain thing that happens when you put yourself on a timeline like that, where it has to work out. And I, that really resonated with me when you were saying that, because I put myself in a similar situation coming out of my last business. I had a little bit of a payout from it. Nothing significant by any means. It was actually quite small compared to what it could have and should have been. And that was a lesson in and of itself. That's kind of what led me to, to do what I do now. But the other thing that happened as a result of that is I had a finite amount of money to burn through before I was on an upward trajectory again. And so I found myself in a, a new business where I just had to figure it out. Tell me about the journey of of just starting in that format, a completely new thing where you, you just had to, it was sink or swim. And tell me about the moments in that sink or swim territory and getting through that. Yeah. Well, I say this often, I apologize to anybody who encountered me when I first was doing this, you know, uh, it's an interesting thing to find a wounded man in his early forties, you know, just gone through bankruptcy and is then trying to reinvent himself and coaching's probably one of the last places you should end up because, you know, <laughs> I found myself for a while really working to impress people that I knew something, right? It was like, it was a way for me to kind of heal and recover. And um, I had enough people in my life and my network that were willing to trust me. And so I, I basically just started um, having learned specifically kind of the mechanics of it um, from Stephen. I, I went out and enrolled somebody into doing it and it's like okay and, and then i rolled another person then i rolled an organization and i had a lot of experience in a family-owned environment so i started working with family-owned companies so that was a that became a real specific niche for me um, and still is I, I love working with family businesses because they're an animal in and of themselves that are unlike any other business and i spent you know the majority of my career in a family-owned business so multi-generational and um so anyway uh but what I would say is that I just started by, you know, putting together. I had no idea how to price it. I had no idea, you know, what the program should look like, even though Stephen had given me some good guidelines. A lot of this comes down to, you know, in this world, how do you see your value, right? Because you can have a guy like Tony Robbins who charges, I think, like a million dollars to do one-to-one -one coaching, all the way down to somebody charging, you know, $100 for the same exact process 
different probably experience, but, you know, and so where's the market? Where's the value? Well, it's all self-determined. And so I think at that initial part, I was a little feeling, you know, not as valuable. You know, I felt like I knew I had stuff to share. I knew I had experiences to share. I just didn't know how much value they had. And so I just started there and, you know, cobbled together a few clients. And then from there, um, got referred to other people through those people. Um, and then one thing led to another. And, and, and next thing you know, I had a, a, a viable practice. My ex-wife had a, um, a business that she had a lot of people that were connected to her through her work. And, you know, she became a, you know, and her range of networked friends and clients became a great referral source as well. Um, and then I kind of narrowed in on like a couple really key clients that I would refer to as enterprise clients, like, you know, where you get to do coaching, you get to do consulting, you get to do, you know, training, all that stuff, the full gamut. And, uh, and so I've been doing that and, and I've had two opportunities to step out of that between 2009 and 2023, where I ended up running as the CEO, hired as a CEO president to run clients, um, businesses. And, you know, so I've had that taste again and, and, uh, you know, um, dabbled with that and, and, uh, and then, but I really love this. Ultimately, this is what I'm, I think, called to do and designed to do. Um, and there's a lot less complicated. <laughs> yeah, call, call a thing a thing. I mean, uh, you know, a couple hundred people in organizations, you know, uh, especially these days, you got so many different challenges coming at you as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. You know, my heart goes out to all of them. Uh, it's not an easy endeavor. Anybody who thinks it's easy is crazy. There's no greater stress than having other people relying on you either it's really really crazy i found myself in a position in my previous business just out of nowhere uh, our first ever contract that we got it took us about nine months to get our first business but our first contract we had we were staffing 60 plus people at one point wow. and wow. so just all working full-time on this contract out of nowhere and we were responsible for paying them daily per diems and weekly yeah. bi-weekly pay. And it, it was a complete adjustment. I mean, having that responsibility of other people depending on you is, is a whole nother level. So it's, I could see where like having experience with both, like the, the one is, I mean, I, do you think that someone, do you think some people are cut out for that and some people aren't? Yeah, I, th I think it's like anything, right? I think there are people who have a natural inclination towards the stress and the responsibility that goes along with starting a business and owning and running one. Uh, and some people would never take that on in a million years, right? And uh, I think the differentiation of work kind of falls out. I think it's the same thing. You know, I, um, I, I, it's interesting. Um, if you observe like the organization of teams or, or people inside different groups, oftentimes the same people tend to step up and, you know, take on a role of leadership, whether it's at a PTA session or whether it's, you know, being the captain of a rugby team or, you know, whatever it is. Um, there are certain people I think have a, a more natural inclination to want to lead and to take that center position. Um, quarterbacks would be a great example from a, you know, an athletic one. Um, and then there's a lot of people who give grace and let that happen and who are, delighted to be an offensive guard, which I once was, you know, <laughs> which, you know, so, I mean, there's no glory in playing offensive guard. You know, you're never going to get put on TV. No one's ever going to say anything about you special, but without you, it doesn't work. That quarterback goes down a hundred percent of the time. If I don't do my job as an offensive guard, right. Period. So, um, and it's an appreciation of all that and, and, and an honoring of how everybody contributes as an individual to the collective, right? So I think that's the piece. So what are some of the biggest lessons that you've been able to, to use from your personal experience to level up other business owners? What are some of the go-tos that are maybe frame changing thoughts that help break them through plateaus? Yeah, I love that question. And I would say anybody who's listening to this podcast, the number one book that I would recommend, and I recommend it to everybody, it's almost mandatory to read it, 
It is called Loving What Is by a woman named Byron Katie, B-Y-R-O-N-K-A-T-I-E. I think Byron Katie's in her mid to late 70s now. Um, and what she created years ago is a simple frame that helps people, and that's all people who are living in a limiting belief, confront the belief, and ideally reverse it. So, you know, I, I, I'm dealing, I, you know, I'd say dealing. I have four kids. They're all in a young professional part of their life. And, I, you know, I was in a conversation with my daughter recently, who's a realtor. And a realtor right now, depending on first-time homebuyers, really tough, right? Because first-time homebuyers are just sitting and waiting with 8% interest rates, and it's a tough market. Um, and you can create a story as simple as, like, you know, there's no more clients out there. And what Byron Katie has as a framework, uh, it's called the four questions is the name of her frame, but it's like, you know, is that true? Because when we have a belief and if it's a limiting belief and we operate on it, our entire lives will go down the path that that thought directs us towards. So if I had the thought, like there's no more clients out there, right? <laughs> then, then what do I do as a result of that thought? Well, there's a lot of things as opposed to the exact opposite, which would be there are an untold number of clients out there. What I do, how I show up, the way I wake up, you know, the way I the way I dress, everything changes out of that one thought. So like the most seminal book I, I have ever read in terms of helping anybody move in the direction of creating a more functional life, period. Um, and then there's a number of different books I could recommend beyond that. Um, you know, and again, I, it's like anything, you know, I can recommend this book. Somebody might pick it up and say, what the heck is that guy talking about this? I, I don't get this at all. And that's fine too. That's happened with me when, you know, um, so I'd say I, I just did a, a small social media post yesterday on this idea of, you know, when it comes to self-awareness, that's the single biggest thing for a leader, right? Is to continuously every day do something that's expanding my understanding of who it is that I am and what makes me tick period and all great leaders all great leaders have a profound commitment to self-awareness I, I i it would be almost impossible for me to name a great leader who isn't self-aware so if you're 18 or you're 20 or 25 or whatever and you're thinking what could i do invest in yourself you know hire a coach have a psychologist or have a great friend who you partner with on this read a book follow a thought leader, you know, um, attend a workshop, you know, look for information that will help you understand who it is that you are, why you do the things the way you do them, what makes you tick, and then how to incrementally get better every single day. What are some of the biggest traps that you've seen again and again that business owners fall into? Yeah, I mean, there's a, I, could, I could make a big list. Um, I think one of them is, you know, feeling sorry for themselves. I mean, that's a big one. Like there's like the victim owner, like nobody wants to work here. I'm the only one who works here. And they get into this whole pathetic, you know, victim orientation. And it's just, it's just not true. Right. Um, but man, if you're stuck in that thought, like nobody here works like I work and you're done, you're cooked. You're going to look for evidence of that everywhere. And you'll find it if you want to, because you want to be right about that thought. So you'll go and look for all the evidence you can possibly, um, you know, mine through and you'll, oh, there it is. There's no example. You know, and you'll find it. So I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, I think, you know, lack of focus, lack of a very clear, specific plan. Um, I often come into companies and the people will tell me when I do my intake work, it's like, we have no idea what we're doing. We don't even know where we're going. This guy kind of walks in here every day and we just get busy and we think we're doing the right thing, but we have no idea. So aligning people to a common set of values, mission, goals, whatever you want. To, there's so many different words you can put on all that stuff, purpose, you know. But the idea is to organize the activity towards a specific set of outcomes and then, you know, have a system and a structure that measures your progress in pursuit of those outcomes. Um Another one would be like, you know, like I call it the shiny penny syndrome, right? It's like you're off, you're doing something, you're actually purposeful. And then all of a sudden, oh, ah, you know, all of a sudden you're distracted by this new shiny penny. And, and that happens a lot because sales drives everything. 
And if there's an organization that's got a plan, but the plan isn't quite working, you know, an owner often will get off and deviate and then dilute all the energy that the organization has been putting in to achieve a set of goals. And now they're off over here and chasing, you know, two sets of goals is a lot more challenging, let alone three, right? So uh, the more disciplined, the more focused, uh, and then if you're going to make a pivot like that, you know, invite people into the conversation, get the feedback, you know, so CEOs, owners who isolate are, are, that's a real huge issue. And they often feel they don't have anywhere to go, which is often where, you know, a coach comes in or a consultant or, a, you know, a, 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 a therapist or whatever, somebody who can help you not feel so isolated. So self-isolation is probably the single biggest challenge. Um, and, and, um, it's unhealthy for everybody. So those are a couple of pitfalls, main ones. I could go on down the list, you know, I've, I've, and I've committed all of them, every single thing that I just said there, I've done every one of them and I am guilty as named and as charged a hundred percent. I'll throw myself in there too. I've committed yeah. them all too. <laughs> <laughs> of That's course. so funny. I, I posted a, a social media clip literally today about that. I have a different name for the shiny penny syndrome. I call it the bikini model on Instagram trap. <laughs> I love it. but i i literally just posted a clip about that today it's so funny i see that one as that's one that a lot of very early stage entrepreneurs fall into because you're not really sure whether what you're doing is working or not and you don't you maybe don't have an, enough evidence to tell yourself that it is working and i think there's this weird kind of balance that you have to figure out where there are times where you have to make micro adjustments, but sometimes entrepreneurs will jump to these macro adjustments that take them completely off course. How do you find the line between those? Yeah, it's a, that's a really great question. I think it's, it's, it's having the discipline to slow down at increments that are designed in your schedule, in your, you know, in, in how you design your time to pull back up, and get out of working in your business and take a look at your business and invite other people to do that with you. Um, I think the biggest mistake that lots of entrepreneurs make and is that they want to do this. They started on their own. Oftentimes, you know, they got that energy of like, you know, I'm going to do it and do it my way. That's why I started. Yes. And, you know, uh, having other people participate that to get other perspectives, you know, um, the greatest thing an entrepreneur can do, is get really clear early on what his or her strengths are, what their gifts are, and then get busy hiring people who complement their deficits, right? And then trust them to come in and contribute and then have the wherewithal, mostly this is a trap of the ego, to listen. You know, the ego doesn't like to listen very often. It just wants to be heard. Um, and if you as an owner, as a entrepreneur are committed to having other people hear what you already know, and what you already think, you're not going to get very far. I, I mean, I already know what I know, right? I, the, the value of assembling a team is like, I want to know what you know and what you know, because when we can bring all of what all of us know openly in a trusting environment where it's safe, um, that's where magic happens. They say some of the, the smartest, most successful people in the world make a habit out of like you'll you'll come across them you'll come into contact with them and they just listen they barely speak at all they're just listening because they realize that everyone else has ideas to contribute and everyone else might have novel ideas that could help influence your direction in a way that you hadn't thought of before and like you said if you're if you're too busy on the ego horse and you're just trying to make your ideas known and, and to cram them down everyone's throat. You can't really cut through the noise and get to those ideas. Right. And I'd say going back to the conversation we had before we jumped into the recorded part of this, um, when I was a young, a younger man leading my family's business, Oh my gosh, did I want people to know how smart I was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like addicted to it. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I got a lot of charge from being right, you know, and, and, you know, and again, um, life has a way of, I, there's a phrase, life has a way of lifing you, right? It just shows <laughs> up. 
and uh, you know, going through that bankruptcy process, told me that my immediate older brother, who kept on talking about one particular part of the business, had a lot more to say and had a lot more value in what he was saying than I ever gave him credit because I just wanted to be heard. I didn't even want to hear him. I was like, okay, God, shut up. Leave me alone. I'm, you know, and so again, just as a thought to consider as a young leader, like keeping that ego in check, like I, yes. And pause. Have I done the job that I have to do by listening to what everyone else has? And am I really open? Am I really open to being challenged and to being, you know, um, willing to invite what they're saying and how they want to contribute into the way we go forward. And, and there are a lot of leaders who don't do that. And then just watch what happens. I mean, you want to talk about killing a leadership team? Oh, I mean, people get conditioned. You know, I, I condition people around me for sure. hundred percent. I don't do it anymore that way. Not, it's, it's a, a different game, but I did, man, I conditioned people to come into a meeting and listen to all the brilliance I had and my great ideas. Like, and then I say, what do you think? Oh, I think you, you got a good idea. Okay. What do you think? Oh, yeah. I stick with your idea. You know, it's like, who did that? I did that. And, you know, so I think that's a, a another one of those pitfalls. Right. So, um, and, and I, I wish there was a way to like have a mirror, you know, in every meeting and you, know, you look across and see the mirror and say, you know, where, where is your ego right now? Like, you know, is it forward? Is it right here? Or is it back here and, and sort of, being managed and, and controlled. So there's another place that I think this comes from. I kind of just put this together for myself as you were talking about this, that I, I think I had kind of identified that ego piece, but this other piece that I just kind of put to get put together and pulled together from what you said is there's this, there's this kind of tendency and urge to feel like the one who is leading the ship and is in charge and to to make your people feel confident in you and i think it's all it's kind of counterintuitive we a lot of times want to bring out all these great ideas so that we so that our people feel like we're we're going somewhere and you do have to do that but i think we do it wrong a lot of times and we'll we'll come out and just cram our ideas down everyone's throat rather than saying hey i know where i where we want to go but how should we get there yeah that's really smart of you and great insight and i think you know um th there is a tendency and i used to say to people listen i i, I mean Jen, i've never done this before like i, I 30 years old running a bit, i've never I, so i am gonna have to figure this out that's why i've hired this guy over here to help me figure it out and i think initially people um, I think thought it was a sign of weakness. Like I got this coach and, you know, why can't you do this on your own? It's like, cause I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, you know, I generally I do. I mean, I get them and I'll work my ass off to, but there are some things here I got to learn. And, uh, you know, so that's another thing. Uh, this is a great one. Um, asking for help, right? Knowing when you're, you, you're in a place where, I've used every faculty that I have to move the organization forward and I'm at an end. What do I do? And so many entrepreneurs will continue to just go back and they insulate, they get further isolated. You know, they double down on what they already know and what they already know isn't working and moving them forward. So that sense of, I got it. I could do that. That's the Einsteinian theory of, you know, insanity doing the same thing over and over again. Right. Um, or I could just recognize that I'm, I'm out of, I'm out of my league and I, I want to bring somebody here and, and I'll learn, I'll grow through the engagement. I'll become better by engaging a consultant, a coach, a, you know, whatever, a resource other than what I've got here, because what I got here isn't working. And sometimes that happens, unfortunately, way too late. And that's when you get guys who come in who are turnaround experts or distress experts. And, you know, the condition has gotten just so dire that, you know, it might not even be salvageable anymore, but, but that's an, you know, I'd, I'd say it's a, a circumstance that could have been avoided. What is the biggest thing that you didn't know 
coming into the second main kind of leadership role that you had that you learned throughout the process that that role where you were the ceo for another business yeah i mean here's i'd say one thing is um i i went into real estate residential real estate i ran a residential real estate company not being licensed not having spent a minute in real estate as a, as a agent or a broker, nothing. And I had this belief, like, you know, um, there's a certain set of skills to run a business and that anybody can do it if they have that set of skills. It's true to a point, but to be ultimately effective, to be really a person that can contribute at a, at the most meaningful level, it's best if you have some industry experience specific to, you know, it would have been, great had i gone through the part of you know process of getting licensed and going through the process of getting a listing on the market and helping somebody buy a home even if i did it once on both sides of the transaction that would have been huge right and i didn't do that and so i i i, I think that was a mistake and um if i were to do it all over again i would do it differently and i'd say um it doesn't exclude anybody i don't mean that either because i think it can work I just think it works better when you have an ability to talk to a realtor who you're working to support and be able to identify with the challenges that they're intimately experiencing. And I didn't have that. I think this is so important because there's so many people right now um, with how many businesses are changing hands right now and are expected to change hands soon. There's so many people considering buying a business for the first time, maybe buying into their second, third, fourth business. And I think it's important to either have that industry experience or some kind of skill set that can bring the business to another level because without one of the two, I I don't know that it's the right call for the business or for the person. I mean, the, I think people buy businesses or or consider getting into a business because they've seen the business have success before, but there is another aspect to it, which is that you've got to be able to continue steering the ship or growing the ship. Yeah, absolutely. At some point in time, the responsibility to do all that becomes yours. You know, the prior owner and ownership group, whatever, whoever is going to take off. And sometimes the top talent can leave with those people who exit as well. And, and then you're left there like running a business and you have no idea what you're doing. I mean, again, mostly about the specifics of the industry. So I, I think, you know, I have a friend of mine, a guy named Greg Aiden, who was in the hotel hospitality industry for like 20 years and, and was one of the top guys in the industry. And then he left um, and had done very well in that industry and he became a coach and a consultant. And at first, for some reason, he was in a story that I, I can't go back into that industry and do any coaching and consulting because I don't know what was going on for him mentally, but he made that decision. And then all of a sudden one day the light bulb went on and said, Hmm, like of all the industries in the world that I could be most helpful to, it would be that industry. And the minute he turned his focus back into the industry that he knew intimately, everything just, um, you know, basically opened up for him. And, and I, I think it was a story he was telling himself, probably, you know, and, and he's a phenomenally talented, you know, leadership coach and you know, all those things, trainer, developer of people. Um, but he had made a story up that, you know, and, and of, of course, he's going to be extremely effective because he understands everything the people who are in that industry confront on a day to day basis to make the hospitality business work, which is why wow, you talk about a challenging business. That's a hugely challenging business. So. Wow. To take a completely different direction, something that just came to mind for whatever reason is we've talked a lot about coaching and consulting, and it's something you have a lot of experience in. I think there's a lot of people newly getting into some kind of coaching or consulting. I think the the internet, my opinion at least, is the, the internet has really opened it up in a really powerful and meaningful way. Obviously, not everyone out there that's doing it is doing it in a in the best way but i think there's a lot of great people that have been able to begin coaching or consulting because of the way the internet has opened that up what are the the things that you think go into being an effective coach or an effective consultant of people 
and how do you how do you effectively bring these people towards the result that they're seeking yeah i love that question that's a smart question um and a thoughtful one i, I think the biggest thing as a skill is to become a master of asking great questions and then having the discipline to close your mouth and listen <clears throat> and then listen as if the answer is coming from your client, um, their lives or their business depend on their answers. And then, you know, um, when I go all the way back to the beginning of my career, <clears throat> excuse me, I was trained by Gallo, you know, effective questions, open-ended questions, basically questions that have no ability to be answered with a yes or no. And then the follow on question was like, okay, say more about that. Why that? Go on. What else? You know? Yeah. And, and, and just probing deeper and deeper. So I operate philosophically as a coach, consultant, you know, advisor in the world of um, this notion of the primacy of self-discovery, which basically assumes that you already know virtually everything you need to know. You're wise beyond your imagination, right? You and I and all of us. And there's things that we have forgotten or that we put in the way of that wisdom. And it's just, you know, with a smart, thoughtful question placed at the right time, what it does is it gives you a chance to unlock all that wisdom and then own the result. So um, I am really reticent to give anybody a recommendation or a suggestion without first having them go through a lot of work. And then, so they'll say, well, what do you think? I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll get to what I think later on, but before I get there, like, tell me what is going on in your mind. Well, here's, okay. Say more about that. Where'd that come from? How long has it been going on? You know, and just deeper, 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 you know, a, as we stop, what did you hear yourself say in all that? So how, listening to yourself and all the things, how would you answer the question you asked me 15 minutes ago? You know, what did you learn through the pro I mean, that's it. Right. And then if they get to the place, I said, you know, so, you know, here's what I heard you say. I'll repeat back to them what I heard them say. You had a question. Here's your question. Here's what I heard you say in answer to your question. You know, as you sit back and think about that, if you applied the answer to that question to your life, what would happen? Okay. Well, what do you think about that? You know, you know, that's do you, what, what's your level of commitment to that? What else can I do to be of help for you? You know, and then, then if they say, well, you could help me, you know, let me know if you think that's a good solution. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you think it's a good solution? You know, so, and, 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 and there's a reason with that. It's very specific and it's designed to help you get to a place. Um, it's not designed to be for, it's to help you own it. So I can't want for you more than what you want for me, period. Never works, right? Ever. So a lot of coaches try to, I think I've experienced a lot of coaches. I, I have a coach right now who's amazing. Um, but I've had a coach for basically 21 of the last so 23 years. I love it. I love being pressed. I love being challenged. I love being asked smart questions and being, you know, drawn out um, all in the pursuit of being the best version of myself I can be. Um, so, you know, that kind of a process has me owning it. If I own it, then I'm accountable to it. You know, and I see a lot of coaches who want to advise and direct. If I told you, like, here's what I think you should do. And you're sitting inside like, that's a, that's ridiculous. You know, you're not going to do any of that. But if I ask you a question and you get to the point where you say, and I'll say, you know, listen, if it was you advising you, what would you do? Well, I'd probably do that. Great. Tell me what that looks like. You know, well, I'd start probably tomorrow. Great. You know, what can I do to help support you? Uh, you could call me. Great. What time? Noon. Fantastic. You know, what do you expect out of that call? Uh, I want you to ask me how I'm doing. Okay, great. What else? And then that, so that's the process. That makes sense. That makes total sense. That's so interesting because I've, I can think of examples on both sides where someone has really just told me what to do and tried to direct me yeah. where even if I thought it was a good idea, I didn't do it. And then I've had other examples where someone has just asked me what I thought I should do. And I ended up doing the thing. I had a coach come on the podcast actually a while back and he, uh, he he just kind of did a coaching session on me almost during the podcast. And he asked me about kind of a key business decision I was considering at the time. And what he did is he just kind of peeled back the layers more and more and 
eventually I kind of, I came to the next step on my own and I ended up taking it. So it's so interesting how it, that is so true. I think that, um, something that came to mind there as you were describing that, that I think might be at least partially responsible for this. Um, are you familiar with Alex Hormozzi? I'm not, no. He's kind of this, um, he's a, a private equity company owner that's kind of risen to um, to fame recently in the the internet world just for having really great advice. And, and I mean, he's got a, a company doing multi hundred million. Um, so really has had a lot of success and very deep thinker. And he talks about a lot about how we, uh, if you diagnose the problem, you can get to the bottom of something. He talks about how a lot of times we have either sadness due to a, a perceived lack of decisions or anxiety due to a perceived overwhelm of decisions. Mm. And I think that fundamentally what might be happening when you're just peeling back the layers like that is that you're cutting through either the lack of decision or the overabundance of decision and getting to what the one decision, the right decision actually is. Yeah, I think that's great. And I, I think, you know, I also want to draw a distinction between coaching and then, you know, sometimes I'll say to the guy, people I'm working with, like, listen, I'm going to switch hats right now and I'm going to name, I'm going to go into a consulting role. And, and, and that has a different energy to it. Um, it's just a belief. You know, I don't think that what I'm saying has any, it's not truth. It's just a point of view from a lot of experience. But like I'll say, um, I've had other clients or I have been in a circumstance. And let me tell you what other clients or I have done in a circumstance like the one you're working through. And then I'll say, what, how do you think that applies to you? So sometimes, you know, and, and I, I, it's not that it's not there. It's just that my sense of coaching, like authentic coaching is me helping you through guided questions, discover what's already innately there. And then the way to move yourself forward where you own it. And I'm a partner in accelerating the process of you getting to where you want to go. That's how I would describe it. Yeah, that's great. This is it's giving me some kind of breakthroughs, actually. This is awesome. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I could have that level of, uh, of value. That's It's been great for me, too. Man. It's a great conversation. I, as I told you before we started, you, know, you have a, a gift at asking questions, and that's the whole base of the conversation is being driven off your questions. That's it's the only way to keep a conversation going forward. I it's uh it's actually something f funny enough before doing podcasting once upon a time I was a personal trainer so I kind of just had to I had to develop this skill because people were training with me for an hour and it was either sit there in silence as they're working out or figure out a way to keep the conversation going. <laughs> yeah, nothing worse than an hour of awkwardness in silence. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> What is uh what is the thing that you're most excited for going forward in your career? Yeah, uh, so right now I'm I got my head down and I am determined uh, I will end up uh, on a TEDx stage. I've got a particular message I want to deliver, um, and you know at 57 I think I'm finally in a place where I have enough wisdom and experience to share it in a place that feels authentic, and it's all about this idea around the distinction between interested and committed. And, you know, what a life looks like when it follows a path of interest versus a path of commitment. And uh, so I'm in heavy pursuit of that. Um, you know, it's, it's a it's an undertaking because, you know, TEDx is the, you know, the marquee stage in the world. Um, well, TED without the X is probably I think that's how it's distinguished. But um, so I'm, I've got my head down, focused on having that as an outcome. And, and, I, and my, my commitment to myself is in the year 2024. I will um, have that opportunity to have my first TEDx uh, keynote. So that that's a milestone I'm shooting for. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just came back from Ireland with my family. That's been a bucket list um, for a long time. And, uh, you know, so some personal things in that regard, but professionally it would be that that's a, a big one for me. Um, and, you know, and, and then I'll, Determine I, there's other messages and other insights I'd love to share. If that works out well, I'll pursue uh, additional opportunities on the TEDx stage. But that's what's driving me right now from a kind of a fun, exciting. Otherwise, you know, it's just every day waking up and trying to make a difference in the world by working with really smart people who are up to great things. 
That's exciting. I'm, I'm excited to hear how that goes and see you on the stage. Um, someone I might connect you to if, uh, if it makes sense, actually, I, I had a, um, I had a TEDx speaker on here recently. That was really great. Nice. Um, so I, that, that might, might, it might be a good connection. Yeah, thank you. Um, anything else that you would want to share with the audience that you think goes into just really excelling at leadership, anything we haven't covered yet, any, anything kind of counter to anything that you've seen out there being circulated right now that you think needs to be set straight? Well, there's a guy that once told me, and I, and I say this in the sense it's counterintuitive, right? We've all probably heard that phrase, don't just stand there, do something. And his was, don't just do something, stand there. I was like, you know, you know. And, I, and I love the counterintuitiveness of that sense that, you know, we are so driven towards acting, towards moving, towards, you know, something. And, and, and this guy is a, uh, his origin is an Indian Sikh. And I don't know if you know anything about the Sikhs, but deeply learned, learned people. Um, it's, it's like the highest caste in all of India. He's, he's a remarkable man. And, and what I got from that is this practice. It was the foundational route to my meditation practice. So I would say if I could give anybody who's thinking about going into the role of starting a business and entrepreneurship, it's to have a set of habits that you practice all around self-care. Meditation is one that has changed my life. I mean, I, I, it's almost like drinking water or sleeping. I can't hardly imagine a day when I would deprive myself of the opportunity to slow down to the speed of absolutely nothing. And then, and then be present with the speed of doing nothing. Um, while counterintuitively, everything is occurring in the nothingness, right? It's sort of <laughs> metaphysical, epistemological, but that sense of working out, you know, um, you, you, we're, we're, we're as human beings, a combination of physical, spiritual, relational, financial, and intellectual. That's the sort of Vitruvian man, that, that image with the, you know, the five points that go out and, and being attentive to all of those points, right? Every one of them. And, and, you know, and, and having a way that you take care of yourself so that you can take care of others, so that you can lead others. Um, so that would be something that I would say, um, and you cannot start that practice early enough. I mean, like you said, your, your audience, if I'm understanding is, you know, a young entrepreneur, let's call it 18 as a starting point up to whatever age, man, if, if I had the knowledge I have now at 57, when I was 18 and, you know, doing the things that I was doing then. And I could get into that. And I know it's maybe an older person's game, but it's really not. These are lifetime practices that um, whether it's yoga, walking in the woods, I don't care what it is, self-care. Um, you will be infinitely better as a human being to all those you lead if you're, if you're both self-aware and take care of yourself. So that's what I would say. I love that. Mark, thank you so much for such an insightful conversation. This has been great. Yeah, it's been totally my pleasure. You have a fantastic format and it's been an honor to be here, Brody. So thank you very much. I, I feel quite blessed to have spent this hour with you. Likewise. Where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you or find out more about what you do? Yeah, so I've got a website. You know, it's pretty easy. Where, and there's a contact me um, in the back of it. It's um, MX5, the letter M, the letter X, the number five, followed by consulting. So MX5consulting.com. Um, and that's probably the easiest way to get in touch with me and, and my emails linked in there and all that kind of stuff, how to get a hold of me. So awesome. Thanks again, Mark. Yeah. Thank that's, you, Brody. And that's a podcast.